Good morning, everyone. Uh, hi. How many uh, malware analysts here in the crowd? People who analyze malware. Few of them. Not very. Not many. Not many. Okay. Uh, I've seen a lot of talk about dealing with malware, malicious code, and stuff. What I want to talk about is how can we use a malware to catch a malware. I needed a catchy topic title, so that's a catchy title there. All right. So. <coughs> A uh, little introduction on myself. Uh, uh, my name is Arun. Uh, I'm a professor at University of Louisiana at Lafayette, and I also have a startup, uh, Cytherial. We did some research for DARPA some time back, and we've converted that into a service, a product. And uh, my uh, strength, or at least my expertise, is in automated malware analysis and indexing. So it's not just analyzing malware, but also indexing so you can search and it can do more from malware. And also automatically extracting rules to detect malware. <coughs> First, a little public service announcement. Uh, how many of you write blogs? No? No? So we had some very good talks here, great uh, presentations. and. Uh, I'm an academic, but I spent a lot of time in Black Hat and Virus Bulletin and a lot of the uh, uh, commercials or sort of prof practitioners conferences. And what I find is there's a good amount of uh, knowledge that is presented, but it's not archived. Archived as in ac academics speak about archive as in something that you can leave and can be found 20, 30, 50 years from now. So your blogs, yes, they are good. They can be found in the next year, five years maybe, but over time they are going to be history. But you may have a lot of good knowledge, not nothing left behind. What we have created is a journal, ACM Digital Threats, Digital Threats Research and Practice. I don't know if Lee is here. So I am a co-editor of uh, this journal with Lee, and we have a specific uh, type of paper called Field Notes. And that's aimed at practitioners. All right, it's aimed, so it's not where you got to say, hey, this is this research, and you don't have to put it in context of related works and all of that story that you typically have to do for academic research. All you have to say is, here's what I did, here's why, why it's interesting, here's the data, here's what I think we can conclude. And your conclusion doesn't have to be generalizable. It just has to be one instance that should be interesting. That should be worth for people to know about. And uh, it will go through some minimal review just to say, hey, yes, this is something of value to the community. And that you have given enough data so people can understand and so on. So field notes. Please consider submitting paper, your findings to field notes. Yeah. OK. I don't have a speaking problem. Sorry, I, I'm not able to hear well, so if you can either speak louder or someone can, I can't take care of it. Uh, can you submit anonymously? Can you submit what? Can you submit anonymously? Oh, uh, yes. Well, uh, not, we ca good question. Okay. So I'm speaking off the cuff now. As a COA EIC, I can make some decisions, I guess. Uh, <coughs> yes, you can submit anonymously. We've got to find a way to do it. So the anonymous as in uh, anonymous to whom? There's no one in the EIC, no one knows about it, or when it's published, no one knows about it. So we've got to figure out what anonymity means. Uh, we don't have absolute zero anonymity at this point, as in you just submit and no one knows who's submitting it. Okay? But if it's a matter of uh, anonymity in publishing, we could uh, definitely attend to that. Okay? Uh, so uh, with that, let me uh, digress a little bit. I know this is operational track, and I said we have a little bit of time, so I'm going to digress into a philosophy track here. All right? uh, so here's the question. In this scenario, someone is banging at the door. Will you wait until the door breaks? Most likely you won't. I mean, it's like someone banging at the door. Uh, you take some action. The door is not yet broken. You're all safe still. But you know someone is banging at the door. You've got to take action. Right? Now, what, why do we treat security as a Boolean state? Either it's secure or it's broken, nothing in between. 
that's the not case that's not the case with the door the door is getting weaker there is a sort of indication that something is going on and question is should we not assess if the security is weakening so we know we are constantly under attack so that's not a, that's a given this is under attack uh, can we not also assess hey are we getting weaker or the attacker getting stronger on our door as in your individual door not someone else's door not your neighbor's door not your uh, some far away person's door so that's a question and so the is how do we assess security state what does it mean to assess a security state so typically what we see is when we talk about attacker and defender we have this notion of asymmetry that the attacker just need to be successful once but the defender's got to be successful 100 times you got to always right that's a asymmetry there is a little corollary to that is that the attacker must try and fail 99 times before the attacker suc succeeds it's like breaking the door you don't just push the door and it breaks you got to be banging at the door you got to be hitting hard at the door and the door at some point gives way and it's not the last hit that broke the door it's the whole bunch of hits that have happened before that are breaking the door and so here what i believe we are leaving on the table is the 99 hits that we have uh, guarded against so can we utilize the attacker's failures clearly at attacker is failing can we utilize the attacker's failures to learn and if you can learn who is the attacker what's the objective who is the target we can learn a whole bunch of things maybe before the door gives away and maybe put something else against the door to make it a little bit more stronger right? so that's the philosophy track and so in this case from malware what could we do there is a little architecture sort of thing if you have a quarantine malware this antivirus is our gate malware is hitting at the gate and antivirus keeping it out at some point the gate breaks and it goes through that's roughly what happens so you have antivirus is uh, breaking blocking the malware so if you can take the malware that is attacking the specific organization it's all sitting in the quarantine no one wants to analyze that malware just sitting there <coughs> and we could do some kind of analysis here add some external threat intelligence and maybe develop an attacker profile so you got hits coming in you get a sense of who is the attacker maybe you can get something about threat actor who are they targeting what do they want to do and create local threat intelligence local as in for you your organization not someone else's organization it's your bank some other bank it's your uh, manufacturing environment rather than some other ma manufacturing environment so if you can construct that of course that will be valuable so that's the philosophy track so i'm going to switch to back to operational track because i believe i have some little piece to the answer to this puzzle small piece there but not <coughs> so current state of malware analysis broadly is in two space two areas you can say reputation uh, places like uh, virus total you take a hash you throw the hash it tells you it's something you say ah it's good or bad you get a reputation a lot of services that do reputation they've already studied the malware so they are binary they already know so they say okay tell me about it you get it it's done reputation <coughs> of course if you don't know anything about it then you throw it in a sandbox there's a whole bunch of sandboxes you throw in a sandbox you get a lot of information you dig through it you figure out okay this is good this is bad and of course there's some more automated analysis you do and so you have this space in between <coughs> if you find something <coughs> good if you don't find something you analyze and so on. <coughs> now what <coughs> we have introduced introduced through my research and now into practice is a content based search for malware so content based search comes from uh, information retrieval where uh, like google images is content based search you can upload an image on google and it will tell you other similar images so you're not doing google sort of query you just put the whole image and say okay tell me what it's similar to so in the same spirit we have a content based search you got a malware collect collection new malware comes in and say oh this is what it's similar to so it's just one search and of course once we have a content based search in this case we are using code 
content based search on code you could potentially do similar thing like uh, there was a talk uh, yesterday about behavior so you could have a behavior collection you throw the malware in maybe you'll extract the behavior do some analysis and say oh these are all the similar ones so but we do content and then of course since we are doing it based on code similarity we are finding similar code we also use the similar code to create yara rules <coughs> so that's the uh, process of we talk about uh, use a malware to catch a malware essentially what it means is if i know i have a malware i can throw it in a collection get yara rules get a lot more information and now i can use the yara rules to go about catching the malware so so here's the uh, example <coughs> if i upload the malware i get similarity malwares these are the malware that are similar <coughs> we do unpacking a little bit of unpacking where it works so we can say hey this is the packed version so these are all the packed version similarity with the packed version similarity with the payload something sometimes pa payload matches sometimes it doesn't match so here it says similar packer different payload so we do some level of similarities it's all based on code except for the unpacking part so once we have the similarity done there uh then uh, we have uh, the key question is okay how do you deal with polymorphism so that's a part in malware is obfuscated that's where you all your hashes and change and so how do you deal with polymorphism so this is an example of polymorphism where if you have a little piece of code the packer uh, so program could transform it all of it is doing the same stuff they all look different and all okay this is a more complex version of it most of the time what i've seen in <coughs> in real code i have not find this level of complexity but this is a more uh, so this becomes a major challenge in code content based search so what we do is essentially take this stuff and run it backwards so to say so we do symbolic interpretation so symbolic interpretation really means that you execute the program but you execute program symbolically symbolically means you sort of compute what is it going to be doing so you have you don't have actual variables you don't have actual registers you say symbolic register so you compute a symbolic expression it's like linear algebra it's like simplifying uh linear algebra equations in li linear algebra so if you take each of the expression you can compute a big linear algebraic expression about what it's doing and then if you simplify it just like what you do in linear algebra you simplify it you get the simplest answer and say okay this is my answer so that's a simplification of symbolic interpretation <coughs> so that becomes the key and you have a uh, fire eye has a uh, something called symbolics they have a open source product uh, project called symbolics it does the same thing you throw code in and it could uh, simplify things for you <coughs> there are uh, other uh, environments like uh, this is all done in uh, the compiler context a lot of people in compiling they do that where where you you have uh, you give it a little uh, piece of code is going to transform it to some internal form do some simplification gives you back some code uh, now what we do is take this as the basis of taking the code and simplifying it and from there on we i uh, have a slide we use this to sort of create the biggest jargon today machine learning so we take this use use the semantics to construct features so that we can find similar functions and once we can find similar functions we then we find similar binaries and say hey, okay these are all similar binaries and so next what you can then do is construct yara rules so this is the yara rule here uh, if you would see i don't know if it's visible there but this is the byte string this is a hex a hex byte string at the bottom uh, and you'll have some question marks as in where where we find some polymorphic changes put some regular expression it's all automated so you have similar code you look at the similar code we know this code is similar because the semantics is very similar and i'm using the word similar here rather than equal and similar we have a little bit of fuzziness that we can allow where they don't have to do exactly the same thing it could have slight differences and there we we match uh, create regular expressions so now you have yara rules and uh, <coughs> how do i construct yara rules again go back to some of the basic computer science uh, uh thing you get taught in regular uh, automata theory and stuff we take a control flow graph program is control flow graph we already found matching procedures so we know they match they're the same and once you have found matching procedures 
we take the control flow graphs and convert it into automata. So this is almost classic done stuff. Take the graph, map it into automata in some sort of transition, and then you take automata from two functions. They are similar. So as you take a union of the automata and say, okay, now optimize it. So sort of reduce the automata. So wherever you need to find uh, things that are asterisks, could we go there? We put it there. So sort of minimize the automata. So it's a reasonably old trick known in uh, automata theory. We use that, and we got uh, rules there. <coughs> so this example of uh, procedures. So here you see procedures. So we look at all of the procedures. We find procedures that are similar. We look at a lot of properties. So the big part is once you find similar procedure, you still have to say, hey, is this malicious? Well, most malware nowadays, they, they, they may have uh, libraries statically linked. And so you got library code. And if you match library code, you're going to be freaking out on some Windows DLL or whatnot. Okay. So you don't want to necessarily create false positives. So what we do is we have each of these rows here represents a function, a function in the malware. And we compute a whole bunch of properties of the functions of one of them is, is it a library? And the way we associate library is a transitive property. It's a strong property. If, if A is similar to B, and A is somehow library, then B is library. So we just say it's a strong property. If I ever anything matches a library, it's a library. So we throw in DLLs. We take IDA flirt and say IDA flirt says this is library. OK, IDA is king, library. So we we go exhaustive. If, even if it's not library, you don't mind. If anything says this is library, this is library. We, library. So that's one way. The other is we also have, uh, it's not in the screen, but we also have occurrences. We count like, OK, we have a large collection of malware. We have this function. How many times does it occur? So it's extremely large. We say, well, it's most likely library. It's too spurious. I don't, you can't have one function in like, 10,000 or 100,000 different malware. Maybe it can, but we'll treat it as so. So we have about 8 million uh, in our collection right now malware. So we sometimes we find 20, 25 million matches because there are multiple copies of the same function in the same binary and so on. So we use some more information here to determine what is the likelihood that this is a malicious uh, program uh, code. And with that, then we go select, OK, uh, I think this is a. We also have a notion of variants. We say, hey, is this a variant? Uh, so we find it doesn't have to match exactly. It could be polymorphic variant. So it may have more blocks, less in more instruction, less instruction. We find variants. We classify them and say, OK, let's look at what we can use to construct the rules. And then we go about constructing the rules. So this is an example. I'm, I would be happy to show a demo. If we have some time, I can connect and uh, demo as well. Uh, but it's based on solid code. So we, I can show you, like, it's just incredibly nice to look at code that is similar with small variations and all. And we uh, construct signatures there. Okay. Uh, so in the spirit of uh, early, we started one of the early, pres I think Jason said, tell about what you can do. What do I do? So that is what I do. Then what, what can I offer? I have the service available, magic service. You upload malware. It gives you analysis and all of that stuff. You are available to use. I can offer that uh, free for you to drive it, drive it hard. Okay, it's still, it's pretty good. I think it's very solid, but it's still, of course, rough edges there. Uh, <coughs> and uh, the the key part in this service I found uh, from experience is not so much of the algorithm, but the data. It's like seven, eight million uh, malware processing takes forever. I mean, it's, it's, it's taken me a long time to get there. So the analysis, the depth of analysis, yep, it can be replicated. But the data is the hard part, I think, analysis to create a large collection. And the large collection is really what the big part we offer there. And what I need, now this is a vision. I started early, hey, these antiviruses are not essentially being used enough, I believe. That's where I'm starting from. Say, you quarantine malware, you stuck it there, you forgot it, and nothing is happening with it. Well, nothing is happening with it because it's too much work to analyze it. So what I think we can do is analyze it automatically. So what I'm looking for is the places to pilot where we connect with the antivirus, pull the malware, pass it through magic, construct Yara rules, and pass it to things like IDS. Bro IDS, for example, takes Yara, 
or pass it into SIM or EDR devices and so on to automatically plug YARA rules that are created based on the threats that reach your network rather than just the threats that are happening somewhere else. Okay. That questions. Okay. I'll need a little question translator. I'm gonna come near because I have a hearing problem. Let's come closer there. Yeah. So I'm not familiar with the real until now. Is that an open source uh, project or what? No. So they're not. The whole thing is not open source. There's a there's a core component of it which does analysis to extract uh, the semantics. That is open. But there's a whole bunch of things built around that's not open. Okay, uh, walk through there. All right, sorry. Yes, yes. You can repeat it. Go again. Are you using the disassembly to compute the features or rely on the pro? Yeah, the question is are we using uh, disassembly to construct the features? Yes, so we do uh, use disassembly. So there are limitations. First is we do disassemble, we do unpack to some extent to where we can. So the we run it in a, uh, a VM, wait for some time, flip a little bit of coins, and they say, okay, it's done, and we pick up some. So 60, 70% of the time, it seems to work. Other times, it doesn't work, but we do some. But once we un uh, unpack, we again disassemble that too. So we disassemble the original, disassemble the final, and from there, then we go about computing all of the stuff. Okay. okay. How did you build your training so, so the good question here, how do we build a training corpus? Now that is a big challenge in malware, the business of training. The training as in the classic thing about training is you have a sample, you associate some known property to it. Okay, this is good, this is bad, this is family A, family B and so on. And the training is important if you build a classifier. A classifier is that you get a new malware, throw it, it puts in a class. It's a big challenge in malware space because how do I build good training data? So what we decided is we're not gonna worry about training, instead we are doing search. In search, what we do is we throw a whole bunch of collections, so we have a large collection of malware, and we're not per se training, we're just searching. So we're searching for similar malware. So once I find similar malware, like in this case, I had this uh, some 10 or 15, sometimes 1,000 similar where then we say, okay, these are similar. I know these are similar. Let's look at the reputation. So now I go back to reputation. Let's look at the reputation of these other 10, 100,000 or so similar. So I'm not per se saying these are bad. I'm not saying it's malware. I'm saying, hey, I can search and tell you whether they are similar to anything known. I can search based on similar code. And when I say things are similar, I have a high degree of confidence that this is really similar. It's not fake. I can actually show you the similar code. I can point and say, okay, this is where the code is similar. So I do similar code. Is it good? Is it bad? That's not nothing I'm saying, it's whether good or bad. There we go, reputation. And assuming it is bad, then I say, hey, I can construct rules based on code that is similar, and then based on some heuristic I used to say, this is most likely a good representative of the sim uh, malicious code. So any code will have good and bad code in there. We don't want to randomly pick any code and say, okay, I'll use this. So, so I'm not making a claim of uh, antivirus. I'm not being an antivirus. I'm okay, I'm do code search, find things that are similar, construct a rule, and then use uh, other uh, indicators to determine whether it's good, bad, or somewhere in between. Okay. okay. Any other questions in the room? Uh, you said if you had time, you could show us a demo? Sure. Let's, so let me let's see a demo. See. Let's see it work. Yep. I'm going to connect just there. Give me a little moment. And I connect to the internet.
So, uh, typically you have your standard stuff of uh, uploading some malware. If you get, it goes through some processing, so not immediate. So, you sometimes want to check, okay, where, where does the processing stand? So, we have some uh, monitoring the status, and then this is something called a report search. And we also have, if I have a large collection of malware, put it in some context and give a little bit more information rather than individual malware. So, we have something called uh, this uh, early warning system. And this is, a this is a little thing we have created where we keep throwing malware in every now and then and create some uh, database. So, this is uh, showing that this is the timeline. Each little dot here represents a malware here. Each little dot, say, is a particular SHA. And uh, then uh, we also have this thing called clusters, the size of the, uh, this is a collection of size 7, which are similar. And this is a, a little larger one, size 41, the similar, the similarity based on code. And then what you do is you want to search similar code, and I have some samples sitting there. So I do uh, similar code. So this is going to go through and show, let me see if uh, you need a bigger, uh, it's too big. This is the, so it says it matched uh, 43 entries and here this is based on, uh, and, uh, this is, uh, we get malware feed from few sources. So we get about 15,000 or so malware data every day. So we stick it in there. So this is based on some similarity with our collection that we get. So, and then we have a notion of payload similarity. Let's see. In this one, we don't have a much of a uh, similarity at the payload level. So when I say packed similarity, I'm assuming this is packed. If I can't unpack it, I just still call it packed. So it could be a file that is really not packed, or we couldn't unpack it. So we are just saying whatever is the original, this is where it matches. So this is a point 0.8913. You can go do something like a bin diff. This one I have a error loading data. This is a bad one. Let's see. Okay. So here is the. It's like a, a bin diff of sort, but so this is showing that uh, file one, file two, location RBA. Location RBA, the function, this function matches the function of line 29. Here I'm showing what I call as clones. And so this matches, so this is a match of the function. And you see the RBA are different. So what I found is most of them, they don't have a lot of great polymorphism. All they have is a code shuffle. Code shuffle is relatively easy to catch. There's nothing much in there. But uh, so this is, uh, this is a similar code. And uh, so you can find, uh, let's see, if I sort it on size, you have uh, pretty large functions that are exactly the same. So it's a huge amount of functions that are same. Uh, in this case, uh, 42, 42 of the functions out of 44 in the total collections are same. So it's like not a whole lot of that is, that is different in there. So that's where we do the similarity part. And then you can go and say, all right, uh, make Yara. And then it will construct the Yara rule. So this, this is our own internal indicator for a function. What function am I using? Yeah. Just, just a second, let me come there. Yeah. Uh, when you print out the components for the strings portion, are they ordered? Ordered as in no, uh, yeah, where you would see them within the binary? Uh, not necessarily, no, no. So the question is, are the strings ordered in where you would see them in the binary? That works when you are looking at one binary. But if you look at the, the uh, function similarity I showed you just now, uh, what you find is that the, these orders, the address here, they don't always match. Things get shuffled around. So if you take a function and say this function should occur first, then the next one, then the next, it's too rigid. It will, I mean, it will work, but it will be too rigid because all they're doing is shuffling functions. Okay, so as we go forward, we could probably look at more stronger indicators, but really 
we just want to say, hey, what I think the key part is, how do I know is this bad? I mean, I mean, what if it's just some, uh, some picked up, uh, happened to match some, uh, let's say, DLL code? Okay, it could accidentally match, not just happen to match. I mean, I just wrote the same code. Turns out similar code is available elsewhere. So that, I think, is a bigger issue. Of, and so for that, what we do is, uh, so here's the case. Let's see if I look at procedures. So, so this each row is some information about the procedure here, each row. And if I look at the name list here, that's the important one. I'm going to sort it, the second name. So we, remember we do association. So if I have a function that's similar to another function and I have a name for that one, I say, okay, let's pick up that name. Okay. So here what we are finding is in my collection there's 830 copies of that function. Right. And for now we're only picking the top 10 names. We don't pick all of the names. So just why it says only 10. And those 10 were all named Lipsy Wait. Okay. It's Lipsy Wait. Although Ida Flirt did not mark it as library for me. None of them was marked library, so it's not library. So right now, Ida Flirt is my king or DLL. I couldn't match it. So maybe I didn't have enough DLL, right? So I got a name here. So that's one important thing. You associate, uh, get the names of functions. So you have uh, similarly uh, here. Now this is a huge collection, 648. <laughs> and let's see. Sleep and thread file close. These are the various names for similar uh, code. So we have uh, this is not always exact name, but so if I was using let's say this function as a signature, I might end up creating a wrong match. Right? Okay, the functions. So we, what we do is first is to say, uh, let's see some more here. This is a. These are somehow the code is similar. They seem to be doing different work, but the code is similar in my definition of similar. Okay. So we don't want to use uh, this code. So we use some notion of occurrence. It should not occur very high, and we're still working on tuning that part. The occurrence, if it's very high, very low, so it's like Goldilocks sort of thing. We want to just just right, okay, not too high, not too low. Just so we're trying to find that right balance, and uh, uh, and then. We use this to select the rules. And so here's the rule selection. So, and then so this is a small code. So we say, well, it should not be too tiny code. 10, 15, 20 instructions are easy to match. So let's try to do a little big. And we don't want to have too big because you know that might be too rigid. It just matches one instance. Who knows? So, or the search will be too expensive. I don't need a huge 50,000 line uh, byte function. This something right. So we are trying to strike a balance and we are, that's still an experimental stage here. And uh, so here's the example of true. This is uh, the, these are all uh, marked as library here. And if you look at the name of the function, sometimes uh, they will match. There's some concurrent Q wraps on. So it's all automated. The key is, okay, typically you would do it the human analyst trying to match code and find this is similar, this is bad, and this is where uh, it's malicious, so to say, and use that malicious as a TTP for uh, going further to have any kind of indicators. Here we do that uh, pretty much all uh, automatically. All right, Ren, uh, I'm going to need to wrap it up, but yep. thank so, you very much. Okay. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.